exciting vaccine talk. The most exciting is going to be at the last session, okay? This is also exciting. All right, so we're going to start off with a question, of course. So how many vaccines should a two-month-old receive? You can use the calendar that you have to check. It's not cheating if you're using your resources. So you have this wonderful calendar. This is by the CDC. It's very, I love it. It's so friendly and so colorful. Um, so this one is the recommendations of what vaccines they should get. So if you look on here, it's going to be six vaccines. So you were right. I'm so sorry, I didn't catch your name. Sonia. Sonia. Sonia, thank you so much. You are the winner of the Jeopardy show. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so you have this with you. And this is something that's also available online if you just look up CDC immunizations. And I encourage the parents to have this as a resource as well. So then they know every single time they're walking in what we're gonna do, it's not a surprise. Okay, so let's talk about each one. We'll start with hepatitis B. You remember this is also the first one that we give at birth. So the first one is at birth. Then we do, we're supposed to do another one at one to two months, and then one at six months. So you really only need three. Most babies actually end up with four, and that is perfectly fine. There is no harm from having an extra one. And the reason they end up with an extra one is we, the combined vaccines that we have out there, combining head B with a different one, gets them the extra one at four months. There is no harm in it. They end up extra in it. Uh, and the reason is we don't have, it's very hard to come by the individual vaccines and no one wants to get six shots to their babies or like you can get away with three, that sounds great. Okay, so then why do we do this? So it prevents hepatitis caused by hepatitis B virus. Also, this can eventually end up to liver cancer and full liver failure and thus end up in death. And just to give you an example, this is an elderly woman in South Asia that ended up having hepatitis B, um, and this affected her liver. She ended up having hepatitis, and then she actually ended up having liver cancer. Um, she's not going to make it, um, but this is what, or she did not make it, um, but this is what it looks like when hep B happens. And again, if mom has this, and baby is not immunized, 90% of the time they end up developing the full disease. All right, the common side effects of getting the vaccine. They're gonna be sore where they got the vaccine. They could have a mild fever. These are all things that we can live with considering the consequences of getting the disease. Now the more serious side effects, so in everything I wanna tell you what are the true things that can happen, um, so there's not any myths. So they could have an allergic reaction. This is extremely rare. This is what we're talking about one in a million or more. Um, so if they have an allergic reaction to a component in the vaccine, then yes, they should never get hepatitis B vaccine again. Um, but this is extremely rare. I have never had this happen. No one in my clinic has ever had this happen, but they can happen. So anything that we could, we, we give to a baby, they could, there's always a disclaimer, you can have a severe and allergic reaction. So not just redness, we're talking about anaphylaxis, swelling of the lips, trouble breathing, full hives everywhere. Um, so it happens extremely rarely. All right, and the contraindications, if any, if they've had an allergic reaction previously. So if we know that they go into anaphylaxis, we're not gonna do it again. Again, I've never had this happen, nor anyone in my life. Okay, up next, the rotavirus. This is the most friendly vaccine of them all. It's oral, it's not a shot. And we give it at two months, four months, and then the optional six months. There's two different brands out there. One requires three doses, one requires two doses. So it really depends on what the clinic carries, which one they're going to need. What it prevents is a rotavirus diarrhea and to vomiting. And with this gastroenteritis, it can be very, very severe for the babies where they're not able to keep up with their fluid intake. And when they when they have so much losses from both ends, they will they can easily go into sepsis and be very dehydrated and they can die from it. And you can have a see a picture here and you can see how blah essentially this child looks. It's just laying there, he's not interacting, someone's pinching him and they're not crying or fighting the person off. 
And you can see how loose the skin is on the abdomen that they're able to grab it. So that tells you how dehydrated this baby is. And this is one of the reasons we are so careful and we try to give the rotavirus as much as we can. It is very common in daycare. You may have had rotavirus. I probably have had rotavirus in my adult life at some point, but we are able to keep up with our fluids. We are adults and we know what to do. With an older child, you can also like, let's go get Pedialyte or Gatorade or whatever you want. With a baby, it's, you don't have that option. So they're much more fragile and any shifts in their volumes can be much more dangerous. All right, so common side effects from the rotavirus, they can have a very mild diarrhea or vomiting course. And I say mild, a day long, that's it. Um, and that's what's a common side effect, a serious one. So this one's a good serious one. So intussusception. So there have been some cases where they've linked essentially um, the rotavirus vaccine. Intussusception, what it means is that there's a, there's a kink um, in, the, in the GI tract. Once you, if you ever develop this kink, um, you need, you never get the rotavirus again because it can be quite dangerous. This is definitely more common in the premature babies, not very common in the term babies. This is one of the more serious side effects. And then again, the contraindication would be if you've had intussusception, if you've had an allergic reaction, and then also if this is a live virus, and that's why you can get a small, like a, a mild diarrhea or vomiting course. So if you have any immunological deficits, if you're missing your um, like bone marrow, for example, or you have difficulties with your bone marrow, and you can't mount an immune defense response, then you, we also don't give the rotavirus. All right, DTAP, my absolute favorite one because it combines so many things. So this one you have in a two month, four month, and six month visits. You also, again, we give it 15 to 18 months, and then four years. And that's the last time we get the T, DTAP. Thereafter, and what you will be getting as well every 10 years is gonna be the TDAP. So what it covers is diphtheria, and that's a throat infection that it has like this grayish mucus, um, a mucus deposit that can get on the tonsils, it can cause very bad sore throat, and then they don't eat and they don't drink, and then also we lead to dehydration and a huge infection. It can also you have tetanus, and that's where it can get the locked jaw a problem, and they can't, it's really hard to overcome that. And then of course, pertussis. So this is another one, the pertussis is very important. So this is the whooping cough, especially in the cold season, we get them all the time. We have so many children right now hospitalized for the whooping cough. Um, it can be a bacterial or it can be viral, um, but with, most of the time it's going to be a pertussis, which is like a bacterial component. The DTAP is the first time that we can prevent this from happening and we can immunize them. And this is up to two months, they're also very susceptible, but we can't give it before two months of age. So that's why every single mom, before they're discharged home from um, the ob gyn for, they also get a TDAP, so they can also have the pertussis component and they themselves don't get pertussis infection, so they can protect the baby. And everyone in the household should as well be immunized against pertussis. Great. And this is what the children look like when they have whooping cough. They look very ill, they look very sad, they're coughing their heads off, and they get a, a lot of inflammation in their throat. It makes it quite difficult for them to breathe. Great, so minor side effects. And when I say minor, obviously they're real side effects, but when I look again at the big picture of getting the disease versus having a child that has a mild fever or a little bit fussy for a day, I personally would be okay taking that risk for my child. Um, and then you can also have some redness and soreness at the side of the injection. The serious side effects. So a high fever, that's one of five or higher. So it's again, it's extremely rare. But if they have such a high fever, that's something we do take into account. Maybe they don't get the next detail. Um, if they have an allergic reaction, again, that also becomes a complete contraindication. And very, very rarely, they do can cause seizures, and that's gonna be the pertussis component, and they never get DTAP again. This is extremely rare, like one in, gosh, is it one million or two million? So extremely rare. Um, I've never had one of these children, no one in my practice has, but it is, it is something to consider. So that becomes one of the contraindications. So if they've had an allergic reaction or a seizure after a previous dose, then we don't do it again. Okay, hip. This one is also very neat because it prevents a lot of things and it has done such a good job of immunizing so many children against it that 
us, the younger generation of physicians, we're not seeing it very often. And the older generation just stares at us like, oh my gosh, you've never seen a hip child because most people are immunized. So we give it to four and six months, and then again, a booster anywhere between 12 to 15 months. It prevents meningitis. So that's an inflammation of the coverings of the brain, uh, pneumonia, epiglottitis, and that's also at the very top of your throat. And that can also be, if that gets inflamed, it makes it very hard for them to breathe, where they need an emergent <coughs> trach. Essentially, they just need to punch a hole really quick through the throat so they can breathe. So we, I have never seen a hip epiglottitis in my year, in my training. Um, but if I were to talk to my mentors, whether in their 50s, 60s, they're like, oh yes, every single day we'd have a couple of kids walk into the emergency room with this. Or I used to do lumbar puncture for meningitis all the time due to hip. But we don't get to see that as often, which is great because we're doing such a good job immunizing against this. So again, the minor side effects, you can have fever, warmth, redness, and swelling at the site of the injection. Um, the usual severe side effects if you have an allergic reaction to it, um, but it's very rare that this happens. And then the contraindication is allergic reaction. I do not have any cool pictures for this one. All right, then we have IPV. And this one, um, again, two, four, six months, and then we give it another booster dose of four years of life. I'm sorry, I'm flying right through these. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. All right, so it prevents polio disease. So again, I personally have never seen polio disease in my practice. Um, this is something that in the US, we can say we have fully eradicated, which is fantastic. Um, and with the IPV, this is an intramuscular version. If the parents tell you, oh, I'm so scared, they might get polio from the polio vaccine. There is, so you have the oral polio, which is much cheaper, and it's done in other areas. It's still used in Asia and in Africa because it's much cheaper and it's a lot easier to give it at schools and just immunize everyone with a quick, you just take a spoonful of the oral polio virus. From that one, you can, there's a very small chance that you can develop a mild version of the polio disease, but there is not, that's not a chance with the, with the injected, the intramuscular polio vaccine that we do here in the US, the IPV. I think they still do it in Mexico to the oral one. I have seen children. Yes, they do. Okay. <coughs> and then of course, this is what the polio disease looks like. Um, back in the day, we used to call them the, the, the lung disease, right? Because they would always be, they'd have to be on the ventilator because then their lungs wouldn't work anymore, their muscles to breathe. Um, so this is something that we have successfully eradicated in the US. All right, minor side effects. You will have soreness. Great, a serious one, allergic reaction. And then the contraindication, an allergic reaction to the previous dose. So it's not very exciting. I have a question. Yes, of course. For allergic reaction, what do you mean? Like hives on the body? So with allergic, so like a serious one. So if they just have a little bit of redness in that area, you can easily mark it as such, but that's not something that I get excited about. I get excited about if they have swelling of their lips, if they have difficulty breathing, Hives everywhere that's actually within like an hour everywhere. That's something that's much more concerning. And if that happens, usually it happens within minutes of being given the immunization. So it's something that we would see in the office if we were to give them. We'd be able to monitor them and do any interventions we need to. So it'd have to be a serious, 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 serious anaphylactic reaction. So think, think like someone who shouldn't eat peanuts that eats peanuts and they have to go with an EpiPen and have to go with the emergency room right away. All right. So then we have the PCV13. This one, similar schedule as all the other ones, two months, four months, six months, and then another booster at 12 to 15 months. And it prevents pneumonia, bacteremia, and meningitis. This vaccine gets updated quite more, more frequently than all the other ones. So it used to be PCV7, so it covered again seven strains. Now we're doing the 13. There is a PCV23 out there, but that one we're saving um, for children that have very severe asthma because they tend to have much more difficulties with pneumonias and getting, um, they get much sicker from that. So the PCV23 is safe for the very sick children. The normal, the average child gets the PCV13. All right, so this is just to show you what meningitis looks like. It can be quite deadly um, from a bacteria. So you can, I don't know if you can see in the image, um, but the brain doesn't have its usual pink, 
um, color that it usually has and the usual ways that it has. You can see there's pus here, there's, it's yellow and icky. And what happens, you get this pus not only around the meningitis around your brain, but you can also get it right underneath, so very close to the brain. That can cause very detrimental effects. And it's deadly since we have a Okay, so minor side effects. You can also have will be a drowsy a little bit afterwards, a mild fever, redness, swelling. So kind of the usual side effects from getting a poke. And then the serious ones, an allergic reaction. Again, all these allergic reaction disclaimers I'm giving you are extremely rare. In the contraindication, if they've had an allergic reaction, we don't give them the dose again. All right, so I think this is really neat, um, the free resources. It is on the handout. So I want to show you this one. One is the CDC, and it has this fabulous schedule that they put out there. Um, it's not on the, it's not, it's on the, the packet. Um, I think it's on the last page, yeah. So it's on the last page, and you can see them there. It's the CDC vaccine schedule. These are free apps that you can download, whether it's an iPhone, Android, whatever you want. Um, and I also tell the parents to download this so they have readily available. So they're not surprised when they come in and they know what vaccines are coming up and they know if their child is up to date or not. So what I really like about the CDC one, it has this, it's also great for adults or for their older child. So this is the first page when you download this and they'll ask you, are you looking for a child, birth to six years, a teenager, um, catch up if they're not immunized and you decide to catch them up, that's great. And then also for adults. So if they're wondering what they need, they have that information too. And then, oh, that didn't show up where it should. Okay, well, when you click on it, um, you'll see, if you see at the very bottom, you see they're born to 15 months. So you can see on there, they can follow, the parents can follow along with the first dose and the second dose, and they know all the schedules. Another free resource that I wanna guide you towards this is my second favorite. Um, this is the CH Vaccine. So it's the Vaccine Education Center. It's this wonderful app that's free and it's made possible by the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, and they do have all these great questions that parents ask you, like, is this safe? What's in my vaccine? How much aluminum is there? Not very much. Okay, how much mercury is there? Is that still a thing? Not. Um, so it answers all those questions for the parents, and it also is great because it has these really terrible pictures of the illness. So then the parents are like, oh, this is what chicken pox looks like, okay. Um, and then they are much more friendly towards getting the vaccines. And it also has the schedule, it's just a different view of it. And you can look up each one, and they'll tell you about the disease, how it's contagious, what the schedule is of the vaccine. These are completely free, so I strongly recommend that you have them on your phone. I have them on my phone. I always show the parents when they come in, so they know exactly where to find them and download them themselves. Okay. Now we're going to shift gears and talk about milestones, but first let me ask if there's any questions about vaccines thus far. Yes. So the, the, so the question was, what's the difference between um, the hip and the influenza? So hip is looking at um, hemophilus. So it's a different bug altogether. It's a different, um, when it's the bacterial and the influenza is looking at the flu virus. Um, and the flu virus, we're not able to give it until they're six months or older. So it's not something that we can protect them from until that age. And it will happen in the next section. Okay, any other vaccine questions? Yes. I have a great section on the flu vaccine up next, um, which I'm very excited about. I love the flu, the flu vaccine. <laughs> I should clarify. And all, like the CDC has done such a great job on all the data that they have on the influenza. It's so exciting. Okay, <laughs> I'll promise. Any other questions? Okay, so let's delve into the milestones really quickly. So the three main ones that I look at any single time a child walks in is their social milestones, their verbal milestones, and then the motor. That's for gross motor, so like the big muscles, and the fine motor, like their skills. Okay, so if you, let me, oh no. Okay, I'm gonna jump over to the other side. So I'm gonna ask you, what are some of the two month um, milestones that you know or have seen in your patients? This is a free test. 
they can just say, no, no, rolling or fiddling. Could you use one word? We have cooing times two, lifting their head, smiling. Cooing again? We're on for the cooing, yes. Hmm? Bring your hands together. We're cooing and smiling a lot. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so predominantly cooing and smiling, which is great. These are all um, different variations. But yes. All right, we're tracking. Yes, that's a good one. It's perfect. Following objects. Yes. All right, I'm gonna jump back into the presentation. Thank you. Everyone's correct. Great. All right. So. All right. So social. They begin to smile at people. They don't necessarily recognize your face yet, but they begin smiling. Um, a lot of parents, and I love it when the parents come in and they're like, oh, I talked to the baby, they're smiling, they're laughing at my jokes, they're smiling at me when I smile at them. I'm like, yes, of course, yes, they understand you, that's right. Um, they don't really see your face yet. Um, I don't, you know, it's a disappointing fact when I share that with them. Um, but usually, and what happens is that three months of age is when they can finally have binary vision, what we call it, they're actually, I'm uh, sorry, binocular vision. Um, before that, if their eye like deviates one way and then comes back, it's perfectly normal. So until three months of age, they don't look at you with both eyes at the same time. It's okay if they do intermittent, like they kind of go back and out a little bit. Um, so then they can finally focus on one object or your face, hopefully, with two eyes. Three months is also when they get color vision. Before that, it's a little bit more of a black and white with pastels. Um, and then also at three months is when they start recognizing faces. So at two months, they're kind of starting to like, oh, this is like a black and white pastel face. I think they're smiling at me. They'll smile back at you. But it's not that they're really fully seeing you for who you are. I don't share this disappointing <laughs> fact with the parents. <laughs> Um, and then verbally, that's when they start having their cooing. And it's so adorable. We all love it when they coo and they don't cry. And then most importantly, the motor. And this is where I find a lot of parents, this is the one that lacks most often, is being able to lift their head off. And this you need to do tummy time for. There is no set guideline how many hours a day you should do. What I've come up and what I tell parents, it's one hour for every month old. So you have a one month old, it should be one hour. If it's two hours, a two month old should be two hours. There's no data to back this up, it's just what I tell them, because I know they're gonna do probably half of that time. Um, so I kind of round it up. And then if they're not doing this tummy time, they don't get to work on their muscles and their neck. Because no one wants to face plant. They all want to look around, right? They want to turn from one side to another to another. And if the parents always approaches them from the same side, they're going to get stuck in that position. So I always tell the parents, walk around your child. They hear you. They want to look for your face. They like your face. They'll turn around. So don't approach, especially if they have any problems with their neck. It's tighter in one area than the other. I always encourage the parents, come from the other side. They will figure out you're on the other side eventually and look towards you. Just give them a couple of minutes. Um, and then also at two months, they should start pushing off the um, when they're in tummy time, being able to push off on their hands a little bit. So the shoulders should come off a little bit. It's not going to be a whole lot, but just a touch. Okay. Then they come back at four months. Now they see your face. They see when you're smiling, they'll smile right back at you. And they start mimicking expressions. If you make a frowny face, they'll look confused for a second and they'll try to frown back at you. Um, I love this age group. As far as the verbal, this is when they begin to babble, but if they don't really cry, um, and also they have their different cries. So they cry differently when they have to be changed, when they want to be held, when they want to be fed. You have this differentiation in their, in their cries. Most of the time, only mom knows those different cries. 
um, or the primary caretaker knows, oh, I know exactly what this baby wants. If you don't, they all sound the same. So when they come in my office, I don't know them. I'm like, I don't know what your child wants. You know them better. Um, and as far as the motor, this is when we can first start rolling from tummy to back. So usually this one comes first because it's much easier. If you think about it, if you are face planting, think back to your days when you're face planting, it's so much easier to just push off and roll off one way versus if you're on your back, like a bug, and you're trying to come over to the front. So it's a lot harder, it takes a lot more coordination, and a lot more motor strength to go from back to front. It's much easier to just push off on one hand and roll over. All right. So this is a four months, and then six months, this is also a very cute age, is when they can start observing themselves in the mirror. Um, and some parents, you'll see some of the toys out there, they'll put a mirror in their crib and they just stare at themselves for hours and they think they're adorable and I think they're adorable. Um, and that's when they, they start being more careful and having the attention to be able to look, oh, there's two eyes, there's one nose, and being able to look at all the different, like at the attention details. And then they also like to play with others, predominantly the parents, um, but they'll play with anyone in six months. So this is also a very cute age. Verbally, they have to babble at this point. If they don't, this is when we get worried. So remember back to the birth, um, the birth section is we do the hearing screens. If I don't have them babbling by six months, we do an urgent referral to have their hearing screens hearing screened because I want to make sure why are they not babbling? Is it more of a de deficit? Is it like something we need to go to speech therapy and work on, on enunciating and making sounds? Or is it like you don't even hear sounds? So you know that you're supposed to be making them. So this is a very important. This is one of the most important checks that we do in six months, making sure that they're able to vocalize in some way. And then I get from motor, now that they have been able to roll in both directions and they're able to sit without support. Some, you will see that they tripod a little bit and they kind of collapse on themselves and that's okay. As long as they're able to have some, even for a millisecond, they're able to sit without any support. Um, the rolling over, at this point, the parents really need to proof their child, proof their home if they haven't done already. Some kids skip um, crawling all together and they realize rolling is very easy and they'll roll to their destination. <laughs> right? Which is like, oh my that's so creative. <laughs> Props to you. Um, so they'll skip the, the, the crawling. So that's why even in six months, they're not crawling yet, but we need to help with the home by that time. Okay. Great. So we'll take a quick break. Let me ask you if you have any questions on the milestones thus far. Yes. When do allergies start appearing? What kind of allergies? <laughs> so they can be the, the most common brushes that we see them for is going to be contact dermatitis, and that's usually when people start introducing um, like baby friendly um, shampoos and like, baby lotions and all of these things have like baby smells to it, right? So they usually it's the fragrance. And we can see it as young as even like a two weeks or one month that we can see them. It's usually it's going to be a fragrance issue that's most common. Um, a true allergy to food at this point is quite rare because they've only had breast milk or formula, so it's quite rare. Um, very few kids do have milk protein allergy, and um, we have to put them in a special formula for that. But it's quite rare. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't manifest with a rash, it usually would manifest with blood in the school. Any other questions? Okay, so we will delve into the next section. So I want to start off with the vaccines. And I want you to think about any random or non-random questions that you have had from parents regarding vaccines, and this is a time to air it all out. Okay, um, I'm excited to see what you guys say. I think I know. Um, hopefully I know, right? There's a question here? Yes, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> what do you think started the whole thing about uh, the connection between vaccines and autism? I have a whole slide and a whole story on that. <laughs> and I'll give you the whole history. I got to learn more about the history preparing in this as well. It's quite exciting. Okay. Um, so this one, I guess, sorry, I didn't realize that the font's going to be 
be so small. So if you want to voice them out loud or if you want to submit them up here at some of the common hesitations, it's up to you. I will take your answers either way. So common hesitations, so I'm assuming autism is going to be one of them. Besides autism, anything else that's exciting? So the question was, if any vaccines cause any developmental delays or special needs later on in life? Okay. Oh, wow, I popped up. Okay. So autism, pain, pharmaceuticals, mercury, yes. ADHD. I don't like how it breaks up this time, so I don't know what, gosh, what Af African child, is it like a question for like specifically for African children, if they need to get any specific vaccines? Mm. Okay. It's a question, or not a question. We have, we work with some um, African American families, they just don't trust, you know, with the history and stuff, they just don't trust the medical system. Oh, that's such a good, thank you for bringing up, so the question was, um, like in the African American communities, there is a mistrust in the medical community. Um, it's there definitely is history. We can't deny it. Um, I think it's silly to deny it. But that's a whole other talk that has so much history ramifications from it. Um, and then definitely more on the adult side than the pediatric side. But yes, it's a good question. Okay, preservatives. Okay. So I'm not gonna go as much into preservatives and mercury and all of that. Um, there is no mercury in any of the vaccines. It used to be on the uh, influenza nasal one, but it's not on the, the intramuscular one. And this is something that also you can see in the app, the, um, the Children's of Philadelphia, the green one. Then you can look up, you know, what about mercury? They'll have that section in there so they can tell you exactly, um, it can show the parents that. Okay. But autism, we're going to talk a whole lot about autism. Okay, I'm excited. I'm hoping. Okay, so we'll start off with um, talking about the MMR, which is the exciting one. Okay, so the MMR, um, we give it a one year and a four year of age. And that's it, two and then you're done for life. It prevents measles, mumps, and rubella. Um, have any of you seen any of these diseases? Okay, we have one. <laughs> so these, because we actually are doing a good job overall immunizing, there's a new trend to not. Um, we did have the outbreak at Disney, right, recently, when we had people outside of the US that were unimmunized that came and they wanted to check out Disney and then they shared their disease with everyone. So we did have a little bit of an outbreak, but overall, the rates are okay-ish. Um, in California, so what you need, you need at least 90% immunization rate to be safe as a community. Ideally, you're at 95%. By 90, we'll take it. There are areas in California that are as low as 25% vaccinated. Um, and those areas are very high risk. Obviously. But even in my area where we do a pretty good job overall and parents don't fight us off necessarily as much, our rate's about 75, 80. So we're still below the mark. The reason we need the 90 is not, ideally of course we want 100, right? But there are children, because this is a live vaccine, that have different deficiencies. Like maybe they have cancer, uh, maybe they have an immune system, they just don't make the, they don't make the cells to fight off an immune uh, and a vaccine or a virus. So we can't give them the vaccine. So to be able to protect everyone, both the healthy children and the ones that are not able to get them, we need a 90% to have herd immunity. Okay, so the minor side effects of getting the MMR is gonna be soreness and redness and fever. That's very, that's common. It's not very exciting. The more exciting one, but still minor, it's gonna be a febrile seizure. What this means is that children, um, especially in this age group, and whether they get the vaccine or not, when they have a fever, they have a higher threshold of having a seizure. So anytime they're above 100.4, they can have a seizure. Usually short-lived, it's not gonna be a long seizure, and it doesn't cause any long-term damage. This one, you can tell, as you can see, it's three per 10,000. 
um, that have that can have the febrile seizure. There's nothing you can do to prevent. You can give all the Tylenol and Motrin that you want to keep the fevers down. That theoretically should help, but there's not much that you can do. Especially if there's a family history of having febrile seizures, um, it can happen. Most of the time, we see plenty of children with febrile seizures, but not from vaccines. From having the flu, for example, or having an illness, a bacterial illness that causes them to have high fevers, 103, 104, 105, and then their brain just can't take that high fever, and they have usually a short two minute, three minute seizure. It's always scary to see your child having a seizure. So we always caution about this. And then some of the major side effects are the only one that's really an, again, an anaphylactic, huge allergic reaction. The contraindication if you have had an allergic reaction or if you have a weak immune system, because again, this is a live vaccine. So if again, they have cancer, if they don't have any white blood cells to mount a response, if they don't have an immune system to do any of this, then they don't get the vaccine. And we have to protect them with everyone else getting the vaccine. Okay, the other one that happens at 12 months is gonna be very solid. So we get 12 months and then four years of life. So it prevents chicken pox, how many of you have seen chicken pox? So at the higher number, yes, okay. Um, and it's so important to get both vaccines. So when I moved from Romania to here, I actually did not have my vaccine as a child. I got one booster as an immigrant child coming through, I got my booster, but that was not enough for me. And I actually ended up having varicella as an adult. Um, and it's quite a whole different story as an adult because it's not just the rash, itchy, and you get over it. It can be quite devastating. You can end up with pneumonia, you have seizures, um, you can have meningitis. I was very lucky. I only had a terrible, terrible rash and I was out of work for a week. Which I got to watch Hulu, so it's okay. <laughs> um, but it can definitely be a whole different aspect of the adult game. So again, it prevents the rash, shingles. If you do get vaccinated and you never have actual chicken pox, you are highly unlikely to have shingles later on in life. Who does not want not having shingles, right? We all do. And then pneumonia and encephalitis. So now because I actually had the true disease, I have a higher risk of developing shingles when I'm older in my 60s and I'm stressed out for any time really, not just when I'm older. That's just life. Okay, the minor side effects, so soreness, redness, and fever, the usual ones. The major side effects can have an allergic reaction to one of the components. And the contraindication, because this is also a live vaccine, it's going to be a weak immune system and then an allergic reaction. So then if you have any of these, you just don't get it. Yes? How do you know if some, a baby has a weak immune system? Like what qualifies them? So at this point, so they're at this point they're one year of age, so I have one year to kind of catch them. Um, if they have, uh, there's several diseases that they screen them with the newborn screen for but that does not catch them all. There's different things that we see. So for example, if the umbilical cord doesn't fall until 21 days of life or later, that signifies that there's an immune system problem. If they have lots of abscesses by this point, if they have declared themselves having cancer, or they have a kidney problem, um, or, they, or they have a transplant, we have babies that have had transplants at this age. So at that point that we know we didn't, they don't qualify for this vaccine. Mm -hmm. All right, so now let me ask you about MMR and varicella together. So we have the option of giving separate vaccines or giving a combo. And let me ask you which one you would do for your child. Would you do MMR varicella combo or the separate one? And um, knowing that they have the same effect as far as pre preventing the illness. So if you want to separate, so it's two pokes for your child, it's A. If you want to combine them, you B. Pretty evenly split <laughs> overall. So let me ask for someone to volunteer from the separate group and tell me why. Yes? I would want to know which one my child had a reaction to if they were going to have a reaction. Okay, so the response was, I would want to know which one they have a reaction to if you give them separately. But if we give them, a, we usually give them the same visit. 
So if they have afterwards, it's hard for me to tell was it from the left side or the right poke. I can't tell. Or from like the upper thigh or lower thigh. But that's true. And ideally, if we were to space them out, yes. Okay, someone from the combo group volunteer. Yes. I'm actually from that. Uh, Separate. Okay. You're like, I represent the other side. I have a question though, because how would you know like the dosage? How much of each are they getting? So it's the same. Whether they get the combo, yes. It's not, we're not cheating them of any if they get the combo. It's not like here's a deal for you. Right. Yeah. All right. A combo volunteer? There's 44% of y'all that had combos. No one. Yes. Okay. My son was terrified of me. I know these are babies, but he had a breakdown. Yes. No, so, so even at one year, they have breakdowns. Yes, they start sometimes that early. Um, absolutely. So combo, the main reason people choose combo is one less poke. Everyone wants to minimize the poke. No one says, yes, I want to get as many individual vaccines as I can for my child, right? Um, so majority of people pick the combo one so there's less poke. But let me tell you um, the questions that I, sometimes I get on this. Okay, so if you get them separate, remember we talked about febrile seizures. Mm -hmm. so if you get the MMR and the varicella, let's say different spots, so two different posts, you have four people, four out of 10,000 babies or one year olds that end up having a febrile seizure. There's this great research that came out, and they're like, oh my gosh, they did give these numbers out. You double your risk if you do a combo. So everyone's like, oh my gosh, it's double. That sounds terrible. But double means eight out of 10,000. So it's still a very low number, but it's true, it is double, to be fair. And these are all their research studies that they looked at over, gosh, I would say 20,000 children when they came up with this data. All right, so knowing this data, that you have double the risk, would you change your mind if you were in the combo group? Or in the separate, you said, now I know I'm not cheating my child. Um, would you do a different, Option. Okay. All right. So again, if you stick with your separate, it's A. If you're going to switch over to combo or vice versa, it's going to be B. So knowing the febrile seizure data, you have brave people. Yes. Oh no! <laughs> Is this an actual option that the parents have? Because like they do. I always give them the option. And this is only at the 12 month visit that you have this risk. At the four year visit, it's not, so we do the combo. I've had no parents ask it ever if they can have this separate. I always present them and I let them have the option. Because um, if I were, if I were to assume that everyone wants less febrile seizures, I would do the two separate pokes, but it's, at the end of the day, it's the parent that takes the child with two pokes, not me, that takes the child home. So they have to make the call if they want a crying, a double crying baby or a crying baby. I let them make that call. Yeah? Would that seizure occur within 24 hours after receiving the vaccination? Yes, so the seizure, the question was how soon would the febrile seizure occur and it would be within 24 hours. It's when they mount the response to the vaccine and they have the fever. All right. So now we have the separates are definitely taking over at close to 80%. And I myself am in the combo group, so the 21% I side with y'all. Um, because again, it was presented, the data was presented any single time you have statistical data, you can, you can um, guide the audience one way or another to gauge it. And of course, we tell them like double the risk. No one wants to take double the risk on their child, right? But when you look at the actual number, now I'm at eight out of 10,000 children. That's still then less than 1% for my child to have a febrile seizure. I know it's not gonna be damaging. Yes, it's scary. It's unfair because I've seen a lot more, so I'm a lot more comfortable with seizure than most people are. So I know how quickly they can come and go. Um, and I'm more comfortable with it. But I would still choose with the 20%, even though I just lost another person. <laughs> and the other 
<laughs> Clearly did not convince you. Okay, that's fine. It's your children at the end of the day, so you guys get to make the call. Right. Yes. So the question was, why can we not do it separately? So you could. Time um, no, so not from a time constraint. So when I say separate, I mean two different injections versus one injection that has both vaccines in one vial. Yeah, so it's not at different times. Um, we very rarely space out the vaccines, and that's only when a parent really, really pushes us. Um, and the problem with having live vaccines is like, can I give you a vaccine for at least 28 days? So if you were dying to enroll in school and you're trying to catch you up, if I don't give you this, the vaccines on the same day, so it can be separate vials. Um, if I give you only one, say parents want to say, no, only one vaccine a day, that's all we're gonna do. Um, I cannot give you another live vaccine for 28 days because the immune system is working so hard to mount the response there, so it's focused completely on the MMR, so I can't give you like a day later or a week later give you the very solid one. So I guess I, as a follow-up, when the research at this point, is there research So it just gave two different vials versus getting one vial. So it's not um, it's not that we're spacing them out necessarily over time. You definitely can. Um, I am very hesitant because parents in general don't have a great follow up rate, and it's not because of me. It's just they don't they don't always come back for their follow up appointments. So it's hard for me essentially to have that trust in the system that the parents will come weekly or monthly or whatever they need to do. I do have some. They're very adamant. You know, I'm not going to do more than one vaccine a day. And then we do have, I do have set up with them every month. I'm going to come and we'll talk and see what we're catching up today. And I have a goal by five years need to be caught up because you're going to school. And they're okay. So I'm like, okay, I have two years to work with you on this. So I do have a three-year-old that was completely unimmunized. And we have monthly visits to catch them up. So that's only for the live vaccine. So that's MMR, varicella, and the rotavirus. And all the other vaccines are dead viruses. Um, so it's a lot easier for the immune system because it's only building the immune system essentially when you give a dead virus is looking at the outside of the virus. That's what we're mimicking in the vaccines. And it's saying, okay, this is what the outside looks of the virus. Should I be, should I encounter this virus later on in life? then I will be able to mount a response. With the live one, um, which is the MMR virus and virus, this one, the problem uh, becomes it's the live virus. It's much attenuated, so it's, it's almost killed, but not quite killed. Um, so that way it gives a little bit more, it's a little bit harder for the immune system to build a response, and they're fighting a little bit more. So that's why I need the 28 days to pass to be able to give another vaccine. It's only with the live one. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna get in the very exciting autism section. So 
If you have any questions, let me know after, <laughs> after this one slide. So I think knowing the history of how it all happened um, is really important. So all of this started back in 1988, and this is when an article was published in The Lancet, which is a British medical journal, very reputable, very amazing, and it was published that maybe MMR can cause autism. Um, and this is what the article looked like. Um, it's been told that it's retracted now, uh, but even that was a long history. Um, it had several really big authors on it, and what they did is they looked at 12 children, and only 12, so I want to highlight that, 12 male children, there were no girls involved in the study, and they looked at specifically autism, and most importantly, what their focus was if they have any GI problems from the vaccines. Their focus was not autism, they just like, oh, let's just add that in there. Okay, so, no one really cared a whole lot about the article in 1988. It kind of goes by, people are like referencing it here and there, but it doesn't gain a lot of media attention until 2002. It becomes very exciting in 2002. And this is when they start publishing it a lot. And in the UK specifically, because this is where it was published, it becomes a lot of questions to Prime Minister Tony Blair. Are you vaccinating your child against this? How's that going? So a lot of the focus becomes on the the more high profile children, and if they're getting vaccinated, it's not even on the research itself. So in 2004, there's this wonderful um, uh, investigator, journalist, Deer, who starts looking into doing an investigation into this, because again, it's only 12 children. Like, wh where is all of this coming from? And he found over five years, it took a long time, he found several discrepancies. So one is that Dr. Wakefield, who presented the initial study in 1988, did not disclose conflict of interest. His conflict of interest was he was actually approached by a group of parents who were like, I think the vaccines are causing autism. My child was perfectly fine before that. Um, and they paid him equivalent of $120,000 in today's money to put this study forth. He did not disclose any of this. Obviously, that's a conflict of interest. Once this came out, a lot of his co-authors dropped and said, I am retracting, I am no longer part of this study, please take my name off of it. Later in his investigation, they found out that they manipulated data. So again, there's only 12 patients, so there's only so much data you can manipulate. But they would go and ask the parents, are you sure this is when autism started? Was it not closer to the vaccine date? Think a little bit harder about it. So they did a lot of manipulation of the data to make it look much more convincing for autism. And they also did, when they were concentrating on the GI tract, there's evidence that they were, um, they changed the reports for children that had MMR given and did, did not have autism. So their link was, there is no link between. Again, 14 million and 700 patients. And that was in 2012. Another study, and this one was published in 2014, this one looked at um, 2 million, this is US specific, over it was 2 million and a half children, also no link. So when parents ask me, is there a link? I tell them, you have a study with 12 patients. That's very questionable how it was done. And then I have studies with 14 million and 2 million children that show that there is no link. So it's really hard for me to compare 12 patients to these vast numbers that have a much, much stronger power, much more convincing evidence. So this is why I tell them when we get in like a deep, well, the medical fund conversation. Does this answer your question? And if not, do you have any other questions on autism? No, that's it. Okay. <laughs> yes, of course. So there's a question from the parent is, and why is autism on the rise? That's also a great question that we are boggled with in the medical field. One, Oh, I'm so sorry. So the question is, why is uh, thank you? So why is autism on the rise? So one of the the, the reasons um, there's several hypothetical reasons, and um, one of them is the definition of autism has actually changed. It's much more inclusive. Before it used to be, oh, um, like this child is very much into math and science. He really likes a computer, and they had autistic traits, but they were not labeled as autistic earlier on. So now we're including them. We have a much wider definition of autism. Um, for example, we also have Asperger, right? So we used to have, it's no longer a diagnosis, it now falls under autism. And these were the excellent engineers 
I was an engineer myself, um, so you know people, and they're very loved in the industry because they're not on Facebook, they're not chatting, they're not, they're doing their work, they're focused on their work, and they're great, right? They don't do any of these social events that take up time, and they were they were loved in the industry and appreciated. But now we're like, you know, maybe they had some social interaction deficits, and it's just part of their personality, part of who they are. But they used to be labeled as Asperger, and now that also falls under autism. So that's one of the main reasons. Um, another another reason is a lot of um, the rural areas are also now being more diagnosed, so they're getting more access to healthcare. Before it was just oh, you know, let Johnny. He doesn't talk to his friends. Just let him be. You know, he'll just do. He'll follow his dad's lead. He'll be a farmer or do whatever. And it was just never picked up. But with including and modernizing and getting more people into the access to the healthcare, we're also helping pick up more patients. Um, is there an actual rise in if we were to equalize all this? I don't know. That I don't have an answer to. No. But and we've changed our diagnosis, so it's really hard to compare our current diagnosis with the previous ones because a lot of the ones were not labeled, so we can't look at any records. Any other questions? That's a really great question. I get this all the time. So you said they don't use mercury as a That's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head, but it is things that are not dangerous to the body. It is in the it is in the app I don't know off the top. I'm so sorry. The question was I'm sorry, thank you. The question was if they don't use mercury, what do they use to um, as preservative in the in the vaccines? I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but the, the main questions I get is mercury and aluminum. Mercury is no longer used in aluminum. It's less than the aluminum that you have in breast milk. We all have aluminum in our bodies. It was a shock to people to find that out. But the aluminum that we have in vaccines is less than the amount that you have in your breast milk. But I don't know what other things that we use as preservatives. It is in the app and all the details. Sorry. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So then the other vaccines that I want to talk to you about, it's going to be hepatitis A. So this one we get 12 months and then 18 months. And it's a two vaccine series and that's it, and then they're done. And um, it also prevents serious liver disease similar to the Hep B vaccine. The minor side effects similar to previous. Low grade fever, soreness, and redness. Not very exciting. Um, and the major one, an allergic reaction that is exciting, but again, is also very rare. Yes? Question. So if you're giving all these vaccines Uh, so, so the question was, if we're giving all these vaccines together, how do I know which one causes an allergic reaction? That's a great question. I also ask this myself because we do give a lot, and it is so rare. Again, it's so rare that they have this. Um, usually, if they do develop a reaction, um, we do do some blood testing to see which component. But it's very rare, so we don't get to do this work that very often. All right. So then, contraindication becomes the allergic reaction to previous dosing. All right. I already told you the answer to this one, but I will ask anyways. <laughs> when can we vaccinate against influenza? Six months, yes, we're gonna skip this one. Perfect, okay. So it's six months because I already Caleb told you the answer. So we are, let's see. So after six months, you can start and you can get the yearly. It prevents the flu, and this can be anywhere from an upper respiratory just the flu symptoms to pneumonia and meningitis. The minor side effects are gonna be soreness, redness, a little bit of fever and aches that can happen with it. And the major one, this is an important one, is Guillain-Barre syndrome. And what this means is you have, it invades your nervous system and it can cause paralysis that works its way up and then you get over it. However, that is a very serious side effect. It is extremely rare, um, one in a million, so it's very, very rare that this should happen. Um, there are only three case reports in all of the U.S. and this happened in adults, it did not happen in children. All right, so the contraindication is if you've ever had Guillain-Barre, um, if you've had an allergic reaction. So, I wanna go to the website, and this is something, um, oh no, please let me go. Okay, so the CDC has this beautiful site on influenza. And when parents talk to me about all this fun stuff, oh no, I don't want to do it. One second. Okay. I always talk 
to them about mortality because at the end of the time, that's what everyone cares about. Is my child gonna die if they don't get the flu vaccine? They all say, I can get over this nipples, we can live through it, no big deal. So I wanna just highlight to you, I don't know if you can see it very well. Um, let me just, we'll only look at this year's data. So this year alone, we're not even done with the year yet. We've had 63 pediatric deaths from the flu. So this is starting back in October. So October, November, December, January, and one, two weeks of February, we've already had 63 pediatric deaths from the flu, um, which I think is pretty significant to look at it. It's pretty equal, male and female, and um, that part is not as exciting. But, one second. Yes, of course. With a doctor who the parent is asking for the shot and is now willing to give the shot to the child. If the parent wants the shot and they don't want to give it to the kid, in the pediatrician's office. I'm so sorry. Can you say that question more? So the parent does want the the flu shot for, for themselves or for their children, children. Mm -hmm. but the doctor doesn't want to give it to the kid. Why doesn't the doctor want to give it to them? I know someone that does it. So oh, I, I have an issue with that. Mm. My he's, the, he's the pediatrician and every time they ask him, he won't give in. Oh, that gets me so hot and bothered. Um, <laughs> so my politically correct answer would be pressing the doctor for why in a kind way. Um, but you can also report this or ask the Department of Health in the county that they reside in. Hey, we want the flu shot, they also give the flu shot. So it's not, the pediatrician's not the only person that can give it. That is very odd, that makes me very, ooh, okay, very hot and bothered. I'm sorry for this person that doesn't want to give it. Okay. Um, Okay, in the interest of time, I will not go through this. I will tell you afterwards if anyone wants to know, but it's a really cool website that talks about the influenza and how it's acting. So whenever it comes to this question, um, I always tell them, I always mention the pediatric death, and then they're a lot more willing to get the flu vaccine because that's something that no one wants their child to die, you see. All right, so to wrap things up, the last component that's really important is some of the screenings that we do. So, what are some of the screenings that y'all know about that we do at 12 months and on? Yes, I have a, yeah. Oh, so earlier, someone asked, like, when a parent says, well, it's not a very effective. Oh, yes. Yes, thank you so much. Yes. Oh my gosh, the data that we have is so embarrassing for the past, absolutely. So back in the day when we used to do the flu vaccine, and every, I'm sorry, the, the nasal flu vaccine. So no one wants pokes, we just do a puff in the nose and everyone walks away happy with one less poke. Um, the data that they found on the nasal vaccine was pretty dismal, about 20% effective. That's very sad and depressing. So that's when the CDC, together with the American College on Immunization and Prevention, um, and with the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, said, this is embarrassing. Let's not do this anymore. So the flu, the nasal flu is off the market completely. It's not even an option anymore until they work on making it better. So we only do the intramuscular one. The current one that we have, it's about 50, 60% effective, which again, is not great stats, but that's the best that we have. Um, what happens is every time the virus that they make the vaccine is based on the most recent data that we have. So if the data, once they put the vaccine out, if the virus goes through crazy mutations, we can't anticipate that. So we always base it on the last season, what the most common strain was, and also we look at the Australia data, because Australia tends to predate us with about a couple of months. So what's common in Australia area, we figure it's gonna come to us since we travel to Australia and back. Um, so that's how the viruses, the vaccines are made. But if the vaccine, if the virus changes in the meantime, that's not something that we can foresee, unfortunately. So about 50 to, uh, so I tell them, um, you know, the vaccine it presents, it prevents about 50 to 60 percent. It does not prevent all the viruses, all the strains. I cannot, no vaccine that we make is 100 percent effective. This is the best shot I can give to your child, and I shouldn't say shot, best chance um, that I can give to your child to fight the virus should they encounter it, but it's not 100 percent effective. 
Um, if they don't get the flu vaccine, I don't get too excited or angry about it necessarily. About all the other ones, I get a lot more because it's right, it is 50 to 60 percent. I push for them. It's something again with all the deaths that we're having, and this is only the pediatric ones. Um, it is something that is so important to prevent, and they have a 50 60 percent chance of not dying from it. If they encounter another strain, I can't help it. Majority did not. Majority did not. And the most common virus that they are dying from is part of the vaccine. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So the last section, we will zoom through it. It's going to be the screenings that we do. So any screenings that you know of that we do. So like autism, I know was brought up. Yes. questionnaire and that we do this every single visit between one month and five and a half. 